Our team of experts now agrees that we can begin the next front in our war, which we are calling opening up America again. President Trump wants America open for business as governors weigh the risks. Health experts are warning they could be making a deadly mistake. Welcome to the first edition of our new program, Inside America, with me, Rida Fakhri. Every week, we will be taking a deep look into the workings of the United States as it faces the coronavirus pandemic and a presidential election. This week, the White House unveiled its guidelines for opening up America again, a three-stage process that will allow states to lift their lockdowns and allow businesses to reopen. As the death toll now inches towards 60,000, several states are easing restrictions despite ongoing shortages in testing capacity. While it has increased in recent days, it is still nowhere near the level President Trump claims, with just 1.5 percent of the population tested for the virus. Now, while Trump called on people to liberate their states from lockdowns, he rebuked the Republican governor of Georgia for violating the White House's guidelines by reopening non-essential businesses like hair salons and tattoo parlors. So is the president playing politics? Joining me now for an in-depth look at the way the administration is handling this crisis is Dr. Tom Price, who was the first secretary of the U.S. Department of Human and Health Services in the Trump administration. Dr. Price, the governors are pressing the administration for testing. The administration, meanwhile, is pressing them to reopen their economies. What's the priority here? What should come first? Yeah, Gita, thanks so much. Wonderful to be with you today. And uh, I, I think the important thing for folks to appreciate th is that this is a new infectious disease. And so we're in territory that we really haven't seen before. Uh, obviously, the first step is, is, is mitigation to try to decrease the transmission of the disease to, to somebody else. Uh, and these are infectious disease 101 kinds of things. Second is uh, diagnosis, and that's where the testing comes uh, in, in place. Uh, and, and the world has done a remarkable job in terms of identifying uh, uh, this, this virus. Third is treatment, and we're working on that around the world, literally. And then fourth, obviously, is prevention, and that's where a vaccine comes in. So um, testing is part of the important aspect of being able to track this virus, being able to track this disease. You can't figure out uh, um, who has the disease uh, or who might be a carrier of the disease unless you're able to test. Uh, and so it's incredibly important to do so. But, but clearly that isn't happening. The, the, the average rate in this country is about 1.5 percent of the population. Your own home state, Georgia, has tested less than 1 percent, yet the governor has gone ahead and reopened many businesses within the state. He's been criticized by President Trump for allowing people to go bowling, uh, to go and get their hair done, to go to tattoo parlors. Uh, is he right or is the president right in saying that it's, it's a bit too soon? Well, uh, I mean, the honest answer is that only history will will tell, uh, and 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 there's no way to know exactly what the right answer is. Uh, the important thing I think to appreciate on on all scales, uh, literal, not just here in Georgia, not just here in the states, but across the world, is that most individuals take the best information that they can get from the experts, especially the scientists and the medical experts, and then try to make the best decision for the individuals who they have the privilege of, of leading and, and representing. Um, but and, is and that, Dr. We, Price, we, is that what is happening? Because clearly President I Trump so. and his administration are sowing a lot of confusion. On the one hand, he is criticizing, uh, for example, the governor of Georgia for opening too soon. On the other, he has been tweeting, calling on people to liberate their states. Is this administration essentially speaking from both sides of its mouth? Is it, is it helping or is it confusing people even more? Well, I think the more productive conversation, candidly, is, is, is what are the solutions? How do we move forward? And the United States is a big country, over 300 million people, obviously 50 different states and, and, and different territories. Uh, and, and each of those states has their own way to be able to approach this. And that's where the, the, um, the responsibility lies from a public health standpoint. There are multiple different models, and, and certain states are using certain models. Other states are using other models. The administration looks at, at, at multiple models. And so the decisions that are being made by governors are being made based upon potentially different models. And that's why when 
and you see numbers or when I see numbers, we say, kind of scratch our head and say, well, how on earth could they make that decision? But in fact, there are models that are, in, for my own home state, there are models that are demonstrating that the number of, of transmission, transmissible diseases is coming down markedly. The number of deaths is coming down markedly. And in order to try to gradually move toward getting the economy uh, uh, moving again, the governor made a decision and his best effort at, at the time. Not, and I think not quite, though, Dr. It. Price, because a lot of the health experts are saying, looking at some of these models that you mentioned, a state like Georgia should be one of the last to reopen. The infections are going up and the number of deaths is close to a thousand as we speak. The former head of the Food and Drug Administration, the former commissioner himself said Georgia was jumping the gun. I just wonder how much of this push to reopen has to do with not just the messages coming out of the White House, but some of the pressures from the Justice Department itself. Let me just read to you what uh, Attorney General William Barr uh, said just a few days ago. He said, the idea that you have to stay in your house is disturbingly close to house arrest. And if we think one goes too far, we initially try to job on the governors into rolling them back or adjusting them. And if they're not, and people bring lawsuits, we file statements of interest and side with the plaintiffs. In other words, we would sue the governors. Uh, again, I, th I think that, that this is all unknown territory. It's all uncertain territory, not just here, but, but around the world. And so the first step in, in, in the treatment of, er, in the evaluation and, and, and responding to any new infectious disease is mitigation. That's the social distancing. That's the physical distancing that, that we do. Once you're able to determine who has the, the, the infectious disease uh, by through testing, then you're able to move forward with making certain that those individuals aren't transmitting it to, to uh, many, many other, uh, other folks in their but, community. But Dr. Price, uh, we're talking uh, about state. the political statements and there are some serious statements coming out of the Justice Department essentially telling governors that they will be sued. The experts, your own predecessor, Alex Azar, has been sidelined and instead you've got the politicians calling the shots, don't you? Well, I, I mean, politicians always call the shots when you get to public policy standpoint. And that, and, and uh, again, th these are uncertain times. Uh, I, again, I think it's incredibly more productive for us to talk about what the solutions are, to talk honestly and make certain that, that individuals have enough information to make their own decision. There was no, no uh, recommendation or no dis policy decision that was made by the governor of, of, of our state and, and governor of other states, as far as I understand, that, that that, that forces anybody to do anything from a physical distancing standpoint beyond what they are comfortable doing. And that's, that's, that's important because people need to have the kind of information that they need so that they can make the best decisions for themselves and for their families. Dr. Tom Price, former Health and Human Services Secretary under President Trump, thank you very much indeed for being with us. President Trump has placed himself at the center of the COVID-19 government response, leading daily briefings on the issue. He has given medical advice, boasted about his high TV ratings, and showered himself with praise. In all, Trump spoke for more than 28 hours in the 35 briefings held since March 16th. Trump has also come under heavy criticism for promoting unproven medications and making outlandish recommendations. So, supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light, and I think you said that hasn't been checked, but you're going to test it. And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And I think you said you're going to test that, too. Sounds interesting. We'll the right, folks who could. right. And then I see the disinfectant, where it knocks it out in a minute. One minute, and is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning? Because you see it gets on the lungs and it does a tremendous number of the lungs. So it'd be interesting to check that. Someone who's been closely watching President Trump's response to this pandemic is Samantha Power, a former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations under President Obama. She's also the author of The Education of an Idealist, a memoir. Ambassador Power, the president has been blaming China. He's been blaming the World Health Organization for not doing enough early on. But as we're now learning, he had been briefed as early as January and February by his intelligence officials and chose to ignore over a dozen warnings in his president's daily briefs. 
How do you explain that? Is it recklessness? Is it incompetence? Is it something else? There was an old Simon and Garfunkel song, a man hears what he wants to and disregards the rest. I think because President Trump's own interest in self-preservation, in re-election, his own political interests, financial interests are always his chief priority. The thought of actually acting upon these warnings, putting in place the kinds of lockdowns that have in fact been devastating to the US economy and the global economy, it was too much to bear. So in the same way that he des denies climate science, he denied intelligence warnings, uh, the warnings of public health officials, the actions uh, that other countries were taking far sooner. Again, if you start from the presumption that he does, that other countries don't have anything to offer America and that global cooperation is for sissies, uh, you're not one who's going to be predisposed uh, to learn from what other countries are going through um, and, and to learn from the measures they're putting in place. So it's a combination of denial um, and hostility to the outside world, I think. You've also called it a meltdown, and you said that we are now, in fact, entering the most dangerous phase of the Trump presidency. What makes it more dangerous now? Now, not just for the United States, but as you say, for the rest of the world, too. Well, first of all, President Trump has, over the course of uh, three and nearly three and a half years, dismantled many of the guardrails that have existed within uh, his administration, guardrails that he inherited, guardrails even like inspectors general that he himself put in place. And in taking away those internal checks and balances, in seeing the limits of how much leaders of the Republican Party are willing to challenge him, and as he begins to panic, given the economic straits uh, that the United States and the world face, given how connected the United States is to events and supply chains in the rest of the world, and as he sees his own approval ratings for his handling of the crisis and his overall poll numbers dropping, one worries uh, that he, uh, who is not the most stable leader in the best of circumstances, could do something rash. And again, without those constraints around him. But did this shocking failure uh, seen from the outside, shocking failure on the part of the United States to deal with this crisis. Did it really begin with President Trump? Because you yourself wrote recently this. You said, well before Trump took office, pandemic preparedness was never prioritized or funded as it should have been. Since 2010, the U.S. has been spending an average of $180 billion annually on counterterrorism efforts, compared with less than $2 billion on pandemics and infectious disease programs. Why did your former boss, President Obama, who President Trump loves to criticize, but why didn't he do more to reprioritize uh, these issues, uh, even though the budget ultimately is in the hands of Congress? Why didn't he do more to make sure that America was better prepared to deal with the next pandemic which he himself actually warned about five years ago. Well, he left uh, an administration that was prepared. He left an administration that had secured from Congress uh, more than $2 billion in funding in the light of the Ebola epidemic and that had put in place a global health security architecture, as well as an office at the White House to coordinate the so-called interagency, the Defense Department, the intelligence community, the health agencies, so that we are all uh, rowing in the same direction. All of that was there for President Trump. And indeed, even having President Trump dismantling uh, the White House office to deal with pandemics, even with the cuts that he had put in place at the CDC uh, and the attempted cuts he'd, he tried to make at the World Health Organization, you still could have seen even this administration stand up uh, an appropriate response had President Trump been willing to accept the intelligence that he was receiving, had he been willing uh, to work with other countries, to learn from other countries, had he been willing uh, to um, liberate the agencies that work for the US government to do what they do best, namely, again, the technocratic details that the so-called deep state uh, are masters of, but he did none of that. And so this really, it's absolutely fair I think, to, as I have, to point to the imbalance between military approaches to national security and these broader approaches that include pandemics and climate change and, and other more comprehensive dimensions of national security. But the administration that was left to President Trump was more than able 
uh, to uh, muster a response that looks a lot like that of Germany, the Republic of Korea, New Zealand, that was well within American capability. But it takes leadership, and that's what's been lacking. And so what happens now? Because I know you were part of that push at the United Nations to go to different countries to deal with uh, Ebola under President Obama. What happens now when President Trump, as you say, has turned away from WHO, has defunded the organization at a time when AIDS groups are saying that as many as a billion people worldwide could be infected, especially those in vulnerable, fragile states that desperately need help and financial assistance. Well, first, just to underscore your point, the human consequences of this catastrophe in the developing world cannot be overstated. And the vulnerabilities that exist in those countries uh, well before this pandemic struck are widely known. The World Food Program was already warning that 130 million people uh, were vulnerable to severe malnutrition this year. They've now added an additional 135 million to that number. That's 265 million people at risk, potentially of starvation, famine of biblical proportions. And that's before you even get to the health effects of a pandemic when much of sub-Saharan Africa, you can't find uh, ventilators, when there are far fewer doctors per capita than there are in many developed countries. And where what you're seeing now are donor countries shrinking their budgets and their allocations for international humanitarian assistance rather than expanding them. So one thing that's going to happen is it's going to wallop uh, poor communities and vulnerable communities. What should happen is that not only the United States, uh, but other developed nations who are finally beginning to bend the curves and hopefully flatten the curves uh, on the pandemic, uh, look upward and outward and realize that we are connected to those vulnerable communities. And so at some point, uh, this insight is going to have to be accepted by even someone like President Trump if he wants to achieve his own objective, which is getting the American economy back on track. He's not going to become a humanitarian overnight. That's not about to happen. It's not going to be out of some sudden uh, burst of empathy for the people that are suffering in vulnerable communities. Uh, but perhaps it can come by virtue of his own conception of self-interest, because we cannot see the kind of recovery that we need in any one of our countries as long as this pandemic is raging uh, in any part of the world. Ambassador Samantha Power, thank you so much for joining me on this program and sharing your perspective. Thank you. Thank you. A few days ago, Trump signed an executive order halting immigration into the United States for 60 days, just 48 hours after announcing his decision in a late night tweet. With some exceptions for those involved in food production, medical research or healthcare, the order affects thousands of people seeking to legally migrate into the U.S. Defending his decision, the president said it was important to help protect American jobs. By pausing immigration, we'll help put unemployed Americans first in line for jobs as America reopens. So important. It would be wrong and unjust for Americans laid off by the virus to be replaced with new immigrant labor flown in from abroad. Let's put this issue in focus with former Republican senator from Arizona, Jeff Flake. Senator Flake, you're someone who worked on an immigration reform plan as a Republican senator in Congress a while ago. What do you make of President Trump's latest decision to close off the country to, to new immigrants? Do, do you agree with him? No, I don't. Um, I think we need more immigration, not less. Um, obviously, we need to change uh, some things about our immigration system and the uh, bill that we did in 2013, the bipartisan bill that passed the Senate, uh, made a, a lot of changes, but it actually increased legal immigration uh, in a number of areas. And I think that's what we need to do rather than restrict it. You say this is what you need to do. And you've called out the president uh, in his handling of this crisis, in the politics surrounding it. Do you then buy his explanation, his rationale, that he is doing this to protect American workers? No. I mean, when you look at study after study, it shows that uh, increased immigration, particularly uh, in our high-tech economy, uh, actually boasts, or boosts uh, U.S. employment. Uh, if you look at Silicon Valley, for example, uh, more than half of the jobs created, I think, over the past uh, several years had at least one of the founders who was a foreign-born student who came here to the United States and helped create a company 
that employs a lot of uh, Americans. That's been really the history of the country and, and that can be the future if we would allow it. So we benefit greatly by attracting talent to the United States and, and I hope that that continues. And the facts also, Senator Flake, support what you've just said, with some 17 percent of the American labor force being of immigrant origin. Uh, is he simply then playing to his base? Is this sheer demagoguery? What is it? Oh, oh sure. It's a play to the base. Uh, the base wants to restrict immigration. It's always a, an easy uh, you know, applause line in a campaign to say that you're going to protect American workers because uh, they shouldn't have to compete with foreigners for a job. That typically isn't what happens, but it's an easy applause line uh, during a campaign. Um, and and uh, you know the the base, uh, the president ran on this, and uh, he he attracted some support. Now, typically, um, you know what happens in a campaign sometimes doesn't translate into how a president governs, and and the Congress certainly pushed back on efforts to restrict legal immigration that the president wanted to do. But uh, it's, it's campaign time again, and, and I think this is a play to the base again. A play to the base, and in fact, according to the Migration Policy Institute, 29% right. of all physicians are immigrants. That's a significant number, isn't it? That's one in every four doctors in the United States is an immigrant. We spoke to one of them, in fact, and this is what he told us. So as an immigrant physician, and a lot of physicians who are just like me, who are taking care of patients in uh, rural areas, they, um, they work there because American graduates uh, don't want to work in those areas. So essentially, we are creating jobs in rural areas rather than taking their jobs. Uh, we are serving their community. We are, we are preventing uh, healthcare from collapsing in these areas. So what do you say to someone like Dr. Singh, who is in fact trying to save American lives right. and who feels uh, undervalued and unfairly accused of taking away American jobs? Well, I say thank you. Thank you for coming here and uh, letting us take advantage of uh, the skills and, and your abilities uh, that you bring to the country. You know, I, it's up close and personal for me. Just a couple of years ago, my father-in-law had a, a ruptured aorta, uh, rushed to the hospital, uh, really didn't give, wasn't given much of a chance to live. Uh, the surgeons uh, that, that operated on him, one was a fellow from Afghanistan, another was a Palestinian uh, who had come here to medical school and had been allowed to stay. And uh, boy, at that time, it certainly hit home to me. And it's not just in rural areas, it's all across the country. We, we are uh, far better because of uh, doctors who come here and go to school and are allowed to stay. You know, I've said many times that uh, you know Trumpism is not really the future for the GOP. Uh, it's it's a demographic uh, cul-de-sac, and uh, you know you can play it out for a couple of elections, uh, playing to the base, but it runs its course after a while. So this certainly isn't the future of the GOP uh, or for the GOP, and I think most of my colleagues recognize that. But right now, uh, the president holds sway. Uh, within the Republican Party. Uh, he is popular among the base, and uh, nobody wants to cross him uh, in a Republican primary. And he's been boasting about his approval ratings yes. among uh, Republicans. This is what he, he tweeted recently. 96% approval rating in the Republican Party. Thank you. This must also mean that, most importantly, we are doing a good, great job in the handling of the pandemic. How would you rate the president's handling, though? Are you part of the 96 percent or are you part of the 4 percent of uh, disaffected dissenting voices within the well, party? The president has certainly been uh, dealt a tough hand and uh, he doesn't deserve all the criticism that he gets, but he deserves a lot of it. And uh, he was slow to recognize this pandemic and some of the moves have, have not been good. I think everybody has to recognize that. But in the GOP right now, uh, particularly, we're still in primary season and uh, you, you don't want to cross politically the president. Um, so I, I can understand the reluctance. But out there in the country, I think people know and polls more generally, general election polling has shown that, uh, that people think the president could do a far better job. Uh, I think that that's pretty evident, particularly after the last week. Former Senator Jeff Flake, thank you very much indeed for, for joining me. us. 
And so in short, whatever one thinks of President Trump's policies, his handling of this pandemic is without a doubt a cause for concern for the majority of Americans, a public health crisis that has already cost more American lives than the Vietnam War, a crisis that has already made over 20 million Americans lose their jobs and livelihoods, and a crisis that has widened the existing cracks in the American dream, exposing the country's economic and racial disparities. Now, while national tragedies usually provide a moment of catharsis, Trump's handling of this crisis has exacerbated tensions between federal and state governments. But more than that, it has exposed, possibly more than ever, the idiosyncrasies of a commander-in-chief who appears to be using a national health and economic crisis to secure a second term. And to that end, he is fanning the flames of discord in an effort to galvanize his supporters at a time when statecraft and steadiness are what's most needed in the White House for America and for the wider world. Let us know what you think. Share your thoughts and ideas with me and the team at underscore Inside America. Until next time, thanks for watching. Thank you.